Hello and welcome to our today's online forum about cabaret and freedom of speech in the German Democratic Republic. During the coronavirus pandemic, uh, you can hear some voices in today's Germany that compare the situation today with the German Democratic Republic about 30 years ago. Um, some people, like the Querdenker movement, for example, uh, claim that you cannot say freely anymore what you want to say and today's Germany might be some sort of uh, uh, pen, uh, some dictatorship. Um, so I thought, why not talking about the situation in the GDR with somebody who experienced it firsthand? But before we start our conversation, let me give you a brief introduction to what is it all about. So first of all, the younger audience of you might not uh, know or remember what the German Democratic Republic actually was. So after World War II, Germany was divided into uh, several um, zones of occupation. So there was a French zone, an American zone, a British zone, and a Soviet zone. And the Soviet zone later on became the German Democratic Republic or better to say East Germany. So we had a East and a West Germany. So the Federal Republic of Germany in the West and the German Democratic Republic in the East. So next point is what is cabaret? So I thought maybe the easiest way to dis distinguish this was just looking up some dictionaries. So I had a look at the, into the Oxford Dictionary, the uh, Cambridge Dictionary, and of course the German Duden. So we define it basically as an entertainment with singing and dancing that is performed in restaurants or clubs in the evenings. And the um, Cambridge Dictionary basically gives a very similar um, uh, definition on that. Well, the, the German one it makes it a bit more precise and puts it more into a uh, political uh, joke areas. So basically, uh, it's a form of, of skits and, and songs that um, criticize current and re recent events and or political circumstances in a very uh, parodistic and uh, funny way. So this is the definition as we know it from the German dictionary, Duden. But one second, criticizing political circumstances and current events. Um, well, East Germany, uh, the GDR used to be, uh, well, today we define it as a dictatorship, uh, used to be a very uh, authoritarian system back in the days. So how was this even possible? Well, according to the constitution of the German De Democratic Republic in, in, uh, in all of their versions actually, so the original version from 1949 and also the versions from 1968 and 74, uh, it clearly states that there is no press censorship and that the citizens have the rights within the limits of the laws, of course, uh, to express their opinion. So how was this even possible? Well, that's something we will talk about with our tonight's guests and it's a very big pleasure for me to introduce him to you tonight. So about our guests, our guest is Mr. Gunther Bünke, a German cabaret artist, author, translator, along many other things he has done in his life. Um, he was born in 1943 in Dresden, in Saxony, and he is one of the co-founders of the uh, a cabaret group Akademixa, uh, originally founded uh, in 1966 at the Karl Marx University in Leipzig, along with uh, Bernd Lutz Lange, Christian Becher and Jürgen Hart. Mr. Bönke remained loyal to his passion for, for the stage and his passion for writing until today. And that you can very clearly see here in a few examples of his publications. So without further ado, uh, let us welcome Mr. Gunther Bünke. Good evening, Mr. Bünke, and welcome to our online forum. Good afternoon and good morning from Leipzig. Um, yeah, it's an autumn day with gray sky but no rain and it's five degrees outside well even though it seems to be freezing there it's, it's getting cold in here as well i think so you can also see from our clothes it's not that tropical warm anymore 
Um, Mr. Brinker, in your recent book, uh, Das mache ich doch im Schlaf, you wrote that, uh, or in, in, in English, I do that in my sleep. You say you started your political or your, your stage career in 1948 already as a dwarf. Am I correct? Yes, my first stage appearance was at the age of five, and I was playing the fourth dwarf, the dwarf number four, <laughs> in the fairy tale um, um, theater production of the um, kindergarten at that time. And uh, the only uh, sentence I had to say in the whole play was, um, the play was Snow White, Snow White, Snow White, I do love you. But my parents uh, were a bit, um, well, um, astonished that I um, trained at home uh, the whole evening, all the parts in the play. So they thought I had to do very much on the stage, but it was only this only sentence, but I knew every role of the play of every dwarf of Snow White and uh, so on. That was how I started on the stage. So I, I, you, you quite remained loyal to the topic uh, fairy tale from time to time. I've seen some skits uh, from you with Mr. Lange, for example, or with uh, um, other uh, cabaretists in Germany. Uh, and uh, I've seen one that where you actively, actually, as in many programs, you actively use Saxon. Um, what do you think, what, what is the, the role for dialects or how, how do you see the importance for dialects in uh, cabaret uh, shows? Well, in cabaret shows, the Okay, I think we might have some technical issues again. Dialect, because dialect was for the ordinary people and the high-ranking party activists um, were not allowed to speak uh, dialect on stage because the first man in the 50s was a Saxon, Walter Ulbricht, and he spoke dialect. And so uh, on stage, you never were allowed as a, a, when you um, uh, represented a party activist to speak dialect. Dialect was only for the low ranking people on stage. So basically, Walter Ulbricht gave you the, the reason or the opportunity to finally use it. Yeah, uh, I mean, um, there were many jokes um, in the, um, well, with people in the street, and they always um, cited Walter Ulbricht as a Saxon speaking, dialect speaking person. And so it was not allowed to use this on stage. Uh, what, what gave you the initial idea to found this? this or co-found this, this cabaret group in uh, 1966? Well, when I started, um, uh, to, when I joined the university, I also joined because of my, uh, well, former career, so to say, uh, on stage. I, uh, at the age of um, 12, I was already on, um, uh, on the state theater in Dresden, and um, I played um, for a number of years on the stage, on the state theater. So when I joined Unity, I also joined the students' theater group. And from this uh, students' theater group arose the cabaret group. And um, we followed another cabaret group with the same name, Akademixer, who were not allowed to continue their uh, performances because of political reasons. But um, this was not uh, made um, evident in, in the public.
public because um, some years ago, another student's cabaret was imprisoned for their performances. And so they didn't want people to know that another cabaret group was not allowed to go on with their work and they had to regroup it um, to, well, to establish it from, um, yes, from the start again. And this was how the academics uh, um, came about. How could it be that you could use the same name like the, uh, like the other group? Well, it was, um, well, the party activists wanted, um, uh, well, it should appear as if this cabaret group was going on and uh, the public did not know that we were other people. It was the same name and um, th there was no copyright on the name of a cabaret group at that time. Uh, did you have any concerns? I mean, you, you said that some uh, group was imprisoned for what they have done. Did you have personally any uh, concerns when you said, okay, let's find this group and let's go on stage? Well, um, I, ca I can't remember exactly, of course, uh, but um, well, I, I think the party um, did not want uh, to put a cabaret, um, a cabaret group into prison again, because um, in the West, this was um, a topic in the newspapers at that time. Um, that happened in 1961, I think. Um, Low, so to say, and we had no um, fears uh, of uh, being imprisoned um, since when times went on, the uh, um, measures of the party against uh, dissidents um, were not as harsh as in the 50s. In the 50s, you could go to prison and in the early 60s um, for what you said in the street. But later on, um, well, you could uh, lose your job. Um, when I worked after the um, after school, I uh, before I started at the university, I worked for one year as, um, uh, well, yes, as an and um, unskilled worker in a chemical factory. And there was uh, one of my mates who was a teacher and he told a joke about Khrushchev at that time. And uh, that's why he lost his job. And he had to work um, as an unskilled worker in a chemical factory, but he did not go to prison. This was the difference to the fifties. Uh, what were opportunities or, let's say, ways to still being able to voice some critical thoughts? Do you mean except from uh, cabaret groups? For example, yes. Do you, do you mean within? When you were on stage, you said that uh, you basically lost any opportunity to, to make career in the GDR when you openly talked or criticized someone. Um, what opportunities or ways did you have um, to still open or to express critical thoughts? Well, you had always to present the show before it was the first night of the show. Um, roughly four weeks uh, before that date, you had to present the show uh, to uh, five party activists and um, after the show, there was a discussion on um, the topics of the show and what were allowed to, uh, to be on stage and things uh, that um, the party activists did not want to be on stage. And um, well, we tried, um, of, um, naturally we tried uh, to get through as much as 
uh, possible of the criticism we uh, put up on stage. And it was always, uh, well, you had the scissors in the head uh, first to start with a text. When you wrote a text, you knew you were not allowed to mention party activists critically or uh, Walter Ulbricht or later on Erich Honecker, uh, the first man in the state and in the party in the GDR, uh, were not allowed to be openly criticized. And people of the security services were not allowed to be openly criticized. But people of the trade unions, for instance, um, and uh, lower um, party activists may be. But uh, the party in itself uh, what was taboo. Um, did you ever get into trouble for something you, you said on stage? Well, not uh, uh, me personally, but um, when we had to present the show for the party activists, um, it happened that they said, no, this sketch, this skit, um, you will leave out. Or if there was a song um, with the names of uh, high-ranking party members, uh, we were not allowed to name Erich Honecker, for instance. Uh, we had to leave out the name, things like that. But we, um, none of our shows was ever um, forbidden, um, which was not the case with the other. We had two cabaret groups in Leipzig. Um, usually you had one cabaret group in each of the um, Bezirkshauptstädte of the uh, bigger towns in the GDR. That is to say, there were 17 cabaret open, uh, official cabaret groups uh, in the GDR. And in Leipzig, we had two. This was the Pfeffermühle, Peppermill, and uh, the Akademixer. And the shows of the Peppermill, um, I think um, in the 60s, two of their shows were forbidden. Uh, that is to say, they uh, performed the show and uh, there were some members from Berlin, from the Central Committee of the party who were in the audience and the actors on stage did not know. And so next day uh, there was a call from Berlin and they were not allowed to go on with the show. They had uh, um, uh, to take it off stage. But uh, in our cabaret group, we uh, were lucky. We did not have uh, a case like that. Thank you. Uh, I think I might be the time to, to open up the round here. So uh, we got one question from uh, my colleague, Katrin. Um, hello, Mr. Um, I want to know if they would say, if they would say you will not be able to perform next time. Did they openly say because you did A, B, C, or did they just be in the vague? Because from other countries, I know that they would say something like, oh, we have a problem with the room, or there is some issues with electricity, so we cannot perform. So they, everybody knows, everybody no. knows it's because of political reasons. So my question in the uh, GDR, did they openly say, Okay, you insulted Erich Honecker and then you cannot perform. Yes. Um, well, there were cases like that. Um, uh, like uh, you mentioned that the room was not uh, uh, officially um, um, used for, uh, for cabaret performances or so. But in our case, we did not have this. We uh, had... Uh, well, there was um, in the 80s, it was maybe in 85, 1985, there was a call from Berlin, from the Central Committee of the party, that we had uh, to all the cabaret groups in the GDR, um, that we had to uh, omit the name of Erich Honecker in all the texts. And we had a song and we sang... 
uh, I know every joke um, existing about Erich Honecker. And then uh, we got a call from Berlin. We were not allowed to use the name of Erich Honecker in any of our texts. And so we sang, we know all jokes um, of the Politburo um, that exists. You know, the Politburo was the inner circle of the uh, part, leading party members, uh, 15 people. 15 male members. <laughs> so it so was they, they openly said, uh, no, you are not allowed to use the name of Erich Honecker, or you, you are not allowed um, uh, to make uh, the people's, uh, the National People's Army, uh, the Nationale Volksarmee, um, as uh, uh, to make it uh, ridiculous. Um, uh, so they openly, in usual, usually they openly said, because of naming this or that, um, you are not allowed to uh, sing this song on stage or to uh, use this skit. But never, we never experienced that a whole show was cancelled. It was only smaller things. So you always knew exactly where the red line was? No, we, we never knew where the red line was. Uh, we had al always to try. And uh, when there was this presentation of the show for these five uh, party activists, we, uh, b before the show, we just uh, said all the more critical texts, we will not um, stress in the, in the representation, in the performance. We will take them back a bit in acting so that they were not so <laughs> dangerous for the party activists. And we, yes, we tried. We had to try. We, first, you tried when you wrote the texts. You knew you were not allowed to take this or to take uh, another topic. And then in the representation and the performance, you tried not to present the more critical things um, so strong. It was always trying to get forward. Uh, one step forward, two steps back. Okay, I think we have uh, one question from the chat here. Uh, could you face any other consequences? Well, you you could you uh, could get um, exmatriculated from the university. Um, I, I don't know um, if there were cases of, except for this cabaret group who was put into prison in 1961, but later on I don't know of any um, cabaret groups or group members who lost um, their um, place at the university. But I, know, I knew several students who were not allowed to go on with their studies because they wrote poems of critical, um, with critical attitudes against the party policy, uh, and they had to leave the university because of reading uh, poems, critical poems in um, open discussion. Okay. Other questions from here? Or from the chats, perhaps? I mean, we have a couple of guests in the chat room. So uh, are there any questions on the chats for Mr. Bunker? Oh, maybe I go for one. Um, yeah, sure. Mr. Bunker, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I would just like to say that uh, it's, it's kind of uh, interesting that uh, when you look back to what you described, you're looking backward. But when we hear what you're talking about, 
I have a feeling that we are looking forward yeah, to what is to come. Um, so there's this, this um, a funny feeling of, um, you know, the past and the future fusing together. Uh, but my question has a bit to do with my interest in um, uh, how to deal with the past, um, with, with the GDR past. And uh, I'm wondering whether, um, because we, we, we learn a lot about the creative industry workers um, in the GDR were part of those targeted uh, for um, a kind of scrutiny, you know, uh, by fellow citizens or by um, state security. Uh, so I'm wondering whether uh, within uh, the cabaret uh, industry, as, as, as you know it, uh, whether there are um, like famous cases of, let's say, workers um, um, scrutinizing each other's work, reporting, you know, um, this kind of thing to, to the state and later on revealed by the um, um, records of the Stasi, for example. Um, are there any um, famous cases like those within the cabaret industry? Um, well, with our um, cabaret group, there were no cases, but in, um, well, before 1961, before the war came up, there were several cases of um, cabaret members of the Pfeffermühle, of the pepper mill, the uh, other uh, professional cabaret in Leipzig, as the second uh, or the first, we were the second. Um, and they went to the West because, um, well, in, in these times, they could have been in prison. They went to the West. Um, well, um, in, in within the work in the cabaret group, there were certainly um, yeah people who uh, reported discussions to the state security, um, to the Stasi, uh, and um, after the wall came down, we uh, found um, um, well the reports of the Stasi on meetings which uh, my um, uh, colleague Bernd Lutz Langer and me, um, there were meetings with uh, critical uh, writers uh, as Erich Löst, I don't know whether you heard the name, uh, we uh, um, met him in his flat and all the lamps were uh, tapped with microphones so that uh, when we later on read the reports of, uh, of the Stasi, um, well, they, they always um, had our discussions uh, on tape. Um, but this was outside the cabaret work. Um, but um, yes, we, we we were among the people whose telephones were tapped and which I got to know after the wall came down that my telephone was tapped. But this was usual. Um, well, I remember uh, nearly at the end of the GDR, I telephoned to my sister and there was a... a something um, in in the telephone. We we talked to each other and then it made <laughs> <laughs> and I said, wait a minute, I think the comrades of the state security are just uh, changing the tape. Uh, but I, I must say, for them. <laughs> this was late in the GDR, uh, two years before I... Uh, did not have dared to speak uh, up like that, you see. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, we got one more uh, question from the chat room. Um, uh, were you afraid or were you not afraid of uh, being on stage in, in, in the GDR? Afraid of what? And I have to... You mean in general to be afraid uh, discussing things of political uh, well, um, criticism. I think that, yes. What do you mean by afraid of? Yes. 
it says yes. The chat says yes. So uh, generally, were you afraid to be on stage? Um, no. Well, I think um, there was, um, in general, after the, uh, 1961, after the war came up, um, it was not uh, the, the question of um, going into prison for something you said on stage, but you could lose your job. Uh, I mean, the, um, in the uh, Pfeffermühle, the pepper mill, uh, the show was cancelled, but they were allowed to go on. They had to stage a new show. I mean, um, and I don't know of any case that somebody was put into prison, into prison after 1961. I mean, uh, in a cabaret group. No, we were not afraid. Uh, there, there's another uh, question, Jet. Uh, do you feel the difference in writing scripts, performance, style after the wall was down? Did you feel the change only slowly or you had been looking forward to the freedom of speech? Well, it, it was after the uh, wall had come down, it was, well, a change in all fields of um, open speech. And nobody, we had, when we staged a show, beforehand we had uh, to give the manuscripts to the party activists, to the leading party men members in Leipzig. And they read the manuscript and then they said, uh, well, this kit or this song, we, we don't think it will help. Uh, the development of socialism in the GDR and um, this was the first stage of censorship and then the second stage was when we had to present the show um, to the party activists to these five people it was at that time um, and um, sometimes after the um, show was staged there were people who uh, went to the security service and to the security police and said, well, the academics have a show which is counter-revolutionary. And, um, well, then for four weeks, every night, there were two people from the security um, in our show and they wrote a report on the show and said, no, it is not counter-revolutionary. This we got to know after the wall came down. But this was the way the security worked. Um, in, uh, two times there was a, a, a in Leipzig uh, of the security uh, service of the Stasi in the show. We knew that they had two seats every night, but this was only uh, during the fair trade times. Uh, this was 10 days, uh, 10 days, uh, two times 10 days a year. In general, there was just, um, well, from time to time, if there were West German journalists coming to our show, of course, there were uh, security people with them. Uh, we knew that. Um, but in general, we, we didn't think about uh, being uh, scrutinized, sur surveyed. Yeah, I think we have one more question here. Did you, did in the, in your case or in your surroundings, did they do some kind of um, punishment for the family, for the children? Because I know from other countries that they would, like if the father or the mother or in the worst both, did some activities which are whatever suspicious, that the children, for example, could not get a good uh, place for studying or 
the you know the sister could not get a um, I mean, they were like the not only the person himself or herself, but people, the children and the sister and even the parents. You know, they were like punished with them. Yeah. But is this well, in, in your surrounding? Well, in general, um, it was in the development of the GDR. There were different stages. There were stages when you. Um, where my wife was the daughter of a parson in Leipzig, what? and she was um, of a um, preacher. Oh, um, a yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um, and she was not allowed to go um, to a higher school. She was not allowed to study, but her father... Um, went to Berlin to the party committee and um, pro uh, protested, protested against it. So um, she was allowed to go to the higher school, she was allowed to go to the studies, but she did not get a, say, a job at the academy or at the university because she did not join uh, the uh, Free German Youth, the Freie Deutsche Jugend, uh, which was a well kind of party for young people, and if you did not, uh, if you were no member of this Freie Deutsche Jugend, um, you were usually not allowed to go to the university. But um, in case you uh, did something wrong. Um, the brother of my wife um, in the 50s he played the um, West German national anthem uh, Deutschland lead um, and in, the, in the school rooms on a piano and for that just playing the um, melody of the West German anthem he was uh, um, repelled from the from school from the high school um, and he had to leave the GDR because he was not allowed to go to any higher school in the GDR and at that time he went to West Germany because the borders were open but this cha it changed after 61 but you always had um, well yes if you had um, relatives in West Germany, in uh, some jobs you were not allowed to take up the uh, um, higher ranking position in the job when you had just for having an aunt or an uncle in West Germany. And um, it, it was not the case if you were, say, a a writer who was not allowed to publish in the GDR. Um, in, usually your children were not um, taken into custody, so to say, for what you did. Okay, any other questions? Um, oh, wait, there's another one. Um, were your shows discussed or scrutinized in the West before and after the world was down? Um, before the wall uh, came down, um, we were not um, present in the West German newspapers, for instance. But after the wall came down, we played in West Germany widely for about five years. Um, I played at all the important West German stages. Lach und Schieß Gesellschaft, for instance, at Munich. I went uh, uh, with my friend and uh, our musician to uh, Munich in 1990. And then our shows uh, were, of course, um, written of in the newspapers. But before the wall came down, nobody um, 
Well, yes, they knew that we were a critical uh, academic um, cabaret group, but um, our shows in detail were, as far as I remember, never discussed in West German papers. Uh, but after the war came down, so basically, your, your success came after the reunification, also in the West. Yes, we. It, it took about five years, and then the interest of the West German audience dropped, and we uh, we stopped to play in the West. So from 1990 to 1995, we were in all important places in West Germany to uh, performance. But then the interest uh, dropped and we had so much to do in the East that we, well, once a year uh, we went to the West maybe, but uh, yeah, we were in, in, uh, in West, West German uh, television stations and broadcasting, um, but this, finished well, mostly after 95. Uh, another question from the chat. How did you learn How English and speak Russian as well? Russian as well? Um, <laughs> I, I think I, I learned Russian for, um, I have learned Russian for 12 years uh, in the uh, ordinary school, in high school. Um, and at the university, but I can't speak Russian. I, I mean, um, I can say um, uh, uh, where I uh, was born, what is my name, and so on, on Rus in Russian, but um, we, we never, um, I never knew how to ask for the way to the station to the train station in Russian, but I knew about the exile of Lenin in a Finnish, um, in a Finnish hut. You see, that was what we learned in Russian about not everyday speech. And um, well, yes, I um, ought to become a teacher of uh, German and English. Um, and that's why I learned English at the university. Uh, since we're talking about Russian, um, uh, I've, I've read that you also had some shows, not just in the GDR, but also in Poland, in Finland, and the Soviet Union. Um, how was your experience there compared to the GDR? Um, sorry, I didn't quite uh, hear the first part of the question acoustically as far as i read that you had also some some shows in poland and finland and the soviet uh, union yeah. Uh, yeah. how did your experience differ there compared to the to, to east germany well um there is a difference between our performances in poland and the ussr and finland um to start with finland we were the only group in the GDR, cabaret group, who started as amateurs, as a student's um, a cabaret group, and turned professional. Um, we, we turned into a professional group in 1979. This is 13 years after we started to uh, perform. And that was the reason why we were sent to Finland. Finland was um, <laughs> was not named a capitalist country in um, in the way you were allowed uh, to go there. Um, as ordinary people, you could not go to Finland, of course, but uh, we were sent there as a group um, to a theater festival because in Finland there was no differentiation between amateur and professional actors at theaters. At the theaters, there were amateurs and professional actors uh, working side by side. And since we had turned from amateur to professional status in cabaret uh, work, we could go there. 
and we had a show in German, but the sketches or the skits were translated uh, into uh, Finnish and the audience had uh, small leaves with all these sketches or the skits um, in Finnish. And it was funny. They were always laughing at the correct place, at the correct spots in the show, since the translation was so good. Um, and in um, Poland, we um, performed for German, uh, for students of the German language, for Polish students of the German language. And the reaction was nearly the same since it was a socialist country and the GDR was a socialist country. The problems were the same and uh, the experience of the audience was the same so that the reactions of the audience were similar to that in the German Democratic Republic. And in the uh, USSR, we um, performed for workers who built the uh, gas pipeline from Siberia to the German Democratic Republic and to Hungary and to Yugoslavia and so on. Um, this was done by East German workers. They uh, fit up the pipelines and we were um, performing for the East German workers. So not for, not for Russian people. I want to come back to the to the censorship within the uh, the uh, GDR. I understand that that when the war came up sixty one, that afterwards things in a way got much much more liberal, because I understand that uh, before that was much more censored and much harsher punished, if you would say something against. And when the war came up, there. What I hear, what I understand from you, what you are telling, then um, things get a little bit more liberal because maybe because they are not so afraid that people would leave the country or whatever. Do you could you say something to that? Well, the the first the first point was that after the wall was up, you could not go quite easily uh, to West Berlin or to mm. uh, West Germany. When I was a child. Um, uh, in the holiday, uh, we went to West Germany because the borders were open. Um, I had an aunt in Frankfurt on the main and we went there. This was no problem. After the war came up, nobody was allowed to go out of the GDR. And um, so um, the danger that we uh, would lose um, well, a lot of uh, working force and uh, of people um, was in, well, w w was not existent. And there was a liberalization. Um, I think the, the difference was before the war uh, came up, you uh, could. Uh, go to prison for for a joke um, but afterwards well you could lose your job for a joke this was the difference and um, but I think it it was not um, well it was not openly declared in uh, some way that uh, there was a liberation um, in the 60s there were a number of restrictions against writers, for instance, in the GDR. If you wrote something which was not allowed to be published in the East, you could lose your license to be a writer in the GDR uh, because you could not publish be if you were not a member of the Writers' Union, for instance, or it was very difficult. And um, so the restrictions were there, but not as harsh as before the wall came up. 
Okay, and another question from the chat was, uh, were your programs also translated into other languages? No, not, not as I know, no, no. Because a cabaret, a skit, is always based on language. And the, the uh, pointe in the end of a, of a skit is very often a question of the language. You could not put it into another language. I mean, if you, if you tell a joke, a German joke to um, British people, for instance, very seldom they could laugh because it uh, right. was not funny in the uh, foreign language. Yeah. Jokes are advanced. Okay. Any other questions online or perhaps here? Yeah, if I may follow up, uh, Mr. Bernke, um, you, you talk about, yeah, okay, you know, that, or you knew that uh, your colleagues knew that there are certain names you couldn't mention, but uh, when it comes to jokes, you could always find metaphors analogies to overcome all those red lines, right? Um, could you tell us a bit about, you know, how, how or in your experience, how those lines were overcome with these different techniques that uh, you've seen or you yourself have used on stage? Um, yes. Maybe, um, well, it was difficult because, um, you, you the if you wrote a cabaret text uh, you could very often not express what you wanted to express so um you made allusions um you uh, uh, well we always said our audience is reading between the lines they we um, we could not, for instance, say something on Erich Honecker, but um, there, I, I just heard uh, um, one one of the um, um, cabaret artists from the Dresden group Hercules Keule, Hercules um, Club. Um, that they had a song um, with with an a name um, Erich. Erich is a, a sportsman, and he is the leading gymnastics teacher. And um, so it was a sports lesson at school. But everybody in the audience knew it was Erich Honecker who was meant by this man who had the name Erich, but uh, he was a teacher at school. So uh, you had, um, well, um, to tell people, as I said, between the lines. And um, we had a, usually we had cabaret shows uh, with uh, single skits. And, but um, we staged a play by um, Mayakovsky, um, Das Schwitzbad, I don't know, um, well, it's a, like a sauna, um, which was written in the Soviet Union in the 1920s. Um, yeah, the, the, uh, the bathroom for sweating is the word by word translation. And um, this was written by Mayakovsky in the uh, 1920s. And we played this in 1987. And um, there were high ranking Russian political uh, activists, uh, so to say, Politburo members, um, very high ranking members in the party um, scale. And Everybody in the audience knew which we we meant the political elite of the GDR. They had Russian names. They were named Ivanov, Svetlov, um, Kalinin, 
uh, but everybody knew it was the elite of the GDR party um, activists. So um, you had to disguise your your texts and your intentions. And in this case, we uh, disguised it behind a, a text from 1922 uh, of the Soviet Union, but it was meant 1987 in the GDR. Okay, any Is other questions? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions online or perhaps here in the room? Maybe if you find my. Um, you, you, you said earlier <clears throat> I was not allowed to, for example, ridicule the elites or uh, ridicule, for example, the uh, National People's Army. Um, as, as far as I know, there has been a movie in the early 60s called Der Reservehelt, which does pretty much do this, um, ridiculing the, the National People's Army. Do you know any other occasion where it did actually happen that the army was ridiculed? Well, on, on stage, uh, never. I, I don't, don't know what you are uh, hinting at, which was it a stage uh, production? I think this no, no, this was a movie from 1961 uh, with uh, uh, Rolf Herricht. Well, kind of joke on stage. In a way, yes. Yeah. Did you no, know? There, there were there were certain taboos. Uh, state security service. Well, all the Politburo, of course. The very high-ranking party members, the, uh, the Stasi, the state security services, the army, and, um, well, yes, the low-ranking low uh, party people could be ridiculed, but never um, <laughs> Erich Honecker or people from his inner circle. So, I mean, when you, when the GDR was far from uh, what happens now in the social media, as far as so-called shitstorms are concerned, so, but uh, I know, for example, in China, very often that um, the, the, the public opinion is used to criticize, for example, um, whoever is, you know, a uh, dissident for the state, right? So did you have in your surrounding, were there people from like the normal public who would be try, who would try to, you know, to um, criticize you or to, um, to tell you to the, to the Stasi or, you know, this kind of thing? Yes, uh, <laughs> there were sometimes, uh, it was not um, with us, not our show, but um, uh, this was a usual way of um, forbidding uh, things. Well, I, would, I wish I could thank him personally uh, again to, to join us for this talk. And uh, I'm very glad and, and happy that we could finally succeed doing that, uh, despite the technical issues we had last time. Uh, Special thanks, of course, to all of you who has been, have been attending here on Zoom, and especially to you guys here. Uh, in person in the, in the in the in our meeting room. So thanks a lot for everyone for joining in. Uh, thanks a lot for asking your questions to Mr. Brunke, and uh, very special thanks to Mr. Brunke himself, even though he can't be here right now. Uh, but I will send him uh, another email to to thank him again. So thanks a lot for everyone, and uh, I wish you all a very nice evening, and uh, maybe see you later at the at another event. Thanks again. Thank you.